Good morning. I'm Alan Bacon, Jr., and uh, we are th uh, so thankful to be here with you. Um, we start everything with gratitude, so please hear this. It's early. It's Friday. We're talking about some tough things, and uh, we do really appreciate you being here. Thanks to Ryan for being a magical uh, human being and everything, and for the full creative team at Creative Mornings for this platform. Thank you so much. Thanks to our staff for being here and for being you. Thanks to our funders for risking it all for this work. Uh, they aren't, um, they're not here, but I mean, you know, shout out to the kids and, and parents. Uh, love them dearly. Uh, we are here to give you the truth about Gang Gang. So, uh, we won't spend a lot of time talking about our personal backgrounds, uh, but it's important uh, for you to know who's leading this organization, and uh, we'll kind of do a quick overview uh, about who Molly and I are in terms of our work. So I'll start. Uh, I've had three big jobs uh, in my career prior to working uh, at Gang Gang. Once upon a time, there was a school called Harrison College uh, where people came for their nursing degrees. Um, we have not seen these slides, Ryan, did you? So, <laughs> so this is going to be awesome. <laughs> that was me. Uh, uh, so I was, I was at Harrison for 12 years. I, mean, I was uh, the campus president of the Northwest campus, and, and that was a blast. Uh, I was 34 years old, like the first black uh, campus uh, president uh, in the history. So it's like, the, like literally, like the only presidents that I knew at the time that were black were like me and Obama. So I was like, <laughs> bro, I'm in here now, man. Uh, then then the, the for-profit education industry just tanked. So ITT closed. I knew Harrison was uh, going to be on the list at some point. Uh, so, I mean, so, so the for-profit uh, industry tanked. And I'm now, uh, you know, finding myself working for a technology firm based out of Johannesburg, uh, South Africa, who had an office in Indy. So uh, I spent a lot of time in Joburg, and I learned about poverty, uh, real poverty, not American poverty. Not to say that we don't have poverty here in the States, but I mean, it looks a lot different uh, around the world. And I learned a lot about who I am. Uh, in Africa, I mean, everyone is black, so there's, you know, there's a hyper-focus on more or less like on who you are and not necessarily um, what you are. And that really just changed everything for me. So I got back to the States full time and went all in on poverty, uh, landed a job at the United Way as the Senior Director of Social Innovation, where I led a million dollar fund uh, to help figure out poverty in central Indiana, which again, is nothing like actual poverty in South Africa, but um, here's uh, kind of what I looked like then. So I had my, <laughs> my, uh, I, I, I see myself right here, and then, I, then it's like, you guys see me too, and now I get immediately embarrassed. Uh, so I don't know why it's, I'm just surrounded by this picture. <laughs> like, why is that? Uh, okay. Uh, I'm also a musician, so that's kind of why the, the gang gang thing you know, makes sense. So music has been a big part uh, of my life, uh, and uh, you know, had gigged with chamber music and, and a couple other bands within uh, the city and uh, took a break to do this gang gang thing. Cool. Hi, it's me. Um, Ryan said he's been doing this for eight years. When he first started, I the one thing I asked him was to never ask me to speak. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Ryan. <laughs> I too have had um, a big few jobs before working at Gang Gang. The first one was at the Arts Council of Indianapolis. I spent five years there and learned everything about how Indianapolis considers its art and culture scene, what it thinks about art and who it calls an artist. I want you to know that at one time, our city spent big money on public art, contemporary rotating temporary exhibitions that pushed big conversations. Um, I think there might be an image of Chikaya Booker's work. I don't know. Is there next? Maybe? Um, <laughs> whatever. Image of your work. Image of my work. Yeah. Chikaya Booker was an exhibition that we worked on, and um, her work was made of tires. It sat in front of the IRT for a while. It was curated by Mindy Taylor Ross. Um, years before the red line, it was called Mass Transit. Her, her exhibition was called Tran Mass Transit. Um, it was art that was helping to shape um, how our city worked. I got to push conversations about new artists that we weren't supporting yet and have legacy moments, like helping to put Anne Dancing, uh, the LED sculpture by Julian Opie on Mass Ave. Then I went to the Madame Walker Theater Center, which was bursting with beauty and seemingly no one around to catch it. 
that's when I fell in love with everything that is Indiana Avenue and everything that is race and art. After that, the city of Indianapolis hired me to get residents more emotionally attached to our city. It was a dream come true. I was the Love Indie Project Manager and I got to think of city beautification. I got to make hashtag Love Indie this huge campaign and introduce emotion of place into city planning. I had my first panic attack when I realized that job contracts with the government end. But I knew I'd found my lanes. Wherever race, art, and civic pride meet, that's where you'd be able to find me. Contradicting that, I ended up taking a job in real estate. Uh. <laughs> I led marketing and community engagement efforts for a $1.3 billion development that we named Waterside. There were 100 acres of land on the White River just across from the zoo, and I got an entire city inspired by its vision with help from my friend Carrie. This is an image of its centerpiece, the historic Crane Bay structure, which was partially destroyed last week to make room for the Elanco headquarters. Each of these roles gave me new insight into how cities work and how to make cities work the way I want them to. Each of these roles gave me relationships that would be critical to anything else I did in the city, and they showed me how systems work, how processes create access and barriers based on the people creating the process. So, then 2020 happened, and Molina's real estate employer decided not to develop Waterside. Sorry, babe. I'm at the United Way, uh, and it really, I mean, at that time, like literally, you know, you all were there, not everyone. Uh, the, <laughs> the baby was not here. But uh, the world shut down. Um, first, the, the global health pandemic, and then the murder of George Floyd. So our, our, our phones were ringing quite a bit. Our city was calling on us for answers at this time because. Uh, I mean, we just, we've been so vocal about racial injustice before it happened. Molly was finding ways to integrate diversity practices in the arts here in Indy. I was integrating equity into poverty strategies for a corporate institution. Uh, I also had my own column in the Indy Recorder uh, called Bacon Bits, where I talked about race, uh, art, and equity. Um, I mean, if you think about the summer of 2020 for a second, I mean, you might remember that, you know, when everything stopped, um, it was, it was a definitive change. So we weren't allowed to go outside. Uh, we couldn't touch. There were fights in the streets, murders, tear gas, tanks, protests, martial law. Here in Indy, things were uh, no different. I mean, and, and, and it was at that point that we knew we had to figure something out and we knew it had to be immediate. We took the opportunity to think and strategize around a new civil rights movement that was happening before our eyes. What is the right thing to do right now for our city, for our careers, for our five teenagers, and for the nation? What could unite people now? What could stand up to the horrific things destroying our cities? People were being lynched again in 2020. So I've got that in front of me in our phones and our emails. We have a lot of people asking to help with their DEI plan. That was the question. Can we engage you to help with our statement, our talk, our strategy, our plan? Normally, I'd have been thrilled at all this contract work because I've been asking for this for years, but it almost made me mad. People that look like me are being hung from trees, and we all just watched a man cry for his mom as he took his last breath. And you're asking me to write down what a diversity strategy should be? No, not now. Not because it's not a great idea to plan, but because I don't have time for that. The gun is to our heads, and guess what? We do know the answer. We actually all know the answer. So instead of writing that shit down, we decided to fucking do it. At Gang Gang, we believe in the power of the arts to change hearts and minds. We believe in the power of the arts to heal communities. We believe in the power of the arts as our nation's greatest advantage and the opportunity to end racism. So that's what we did. I mean, we, we just fucking did it. Uh, and if everything in 2020 was about what separates people uh, from the race pandemic to the health pandemic, 
It is truly, and, and we thought, I mean, what, what brings people together? The answer is culture. It's the arts, it's storytelling, singing, sharing a meal, fashion, watching a film. It's the way we move about life. Let me tell you why this is important, and let me tell you why we turn to art in this moment. A little bit of a history lesson, I'll explain. But we are only 140 years post-slavery as law in America. Legit. We are closer to slavery than we are away from slavery. We're talking about three generations, like your mama's mama's mama. I mentioned earlier about my time in Johannesburg. I was excited to go back to Africa. I mean, it's, it's, it's my people. You know, everyone's black. It's going to be like the Black Panther. <laughs> but I never felt less black than being right in the core of Africa. Black people's relationship in the state start with melanin. That's where our identification begins. But in Africa, like, everybody's black. So, I mean, so the first point of identification is actually culture and not melanin. And we know what that feels like being black here in the States. Hey, what's good, homie? Hey, how you doing? What's up? We, we can pick each other out. So it does start with melanin. It starts with what we are. And they share their, their identity, they share their culture, their, and it's all through art. In South Africa, I mean, they'll tell you about the languages they speak, the relevance and the reverence of the land that they're standing on. They'll tell you about their fashion and their music and all about the foods that they eat and why it's important to know your ancestry. Their identity was baked into who they are. Our identity in the States is baked into what we are. Stick with me for a second. So, when African slaves were brought to America, what was taken? What was that? The culture. Culture. When slaves were brought here, our identity was taken. Our fashion, our music, our food, our language, our art. Colonizers during the slave trade even complained <laughs> as slave ships sailed from Africa, even complained of the constant singing and how it began to, to sound too sorrowful. So during slavery, there were Negro spirituals. It wasn't just about the spiritual connectivity when slaves would sing Wade in the Water along the Underground Railroad. Those songs were telling you also to get in the water so the dogs can't smell you. Art has carried us through our country's greatest atrocities. During the Jim Crow era, we had the Harlem Renaissance happen, an artistic explosion of black literature, music, and fashion, a period that sparked the evolution of American culture, culture that has been significantly shaped by the creativity of black artists. And then there's the 1960s. During the time of the Civil Rights Movement, we had Marvin Gaye, Maya Angelou, Curtis Mayfield, James Baldwin, Zora Neale Hurston, Aretha Franklin, Harry Belafonte, Stevie Wonder, Jimi Hendrix, artist. Renaissance is a French word meaning rebirth. A renaissance is the revival of art. And in American history, each renaissance Inches, inches African American people closer to liberation because we're putting more identity back into culture and people through art. Fast forward another 60 years from uh, the first civil rights movement to 2020. And then we have the murder of George Floyd, another American atrocity, followed by yet another Renaissance period. At Gang Gang, we recognize this renaissance, and we are moving at the speed of culture to power it. That's really good stuff. Yes, that was some heavy shit. Yeah. I and our team, um, we basically sit in these history lessons every day <laughs> and figure out how to articulate that through programming and advocacy. Those are our jobs at Gang Gang. 
to make cities equitable by revealing the truth about it through advocacy and programming. Gang Gang is a vehicle to make cities more beautiful, cultural, and equitable, and we've been experimenting on Indianapolis for the last two years. Our experiment is to center the creatives, and by doing that, we have retained talent in Indy, King will tell you. We have attracted talent, the guy at Amani's studio on 38th and Illinois will tell you. He came from Philly because he Googled us, which is crazy. <laughs> we have brokered opportunities that turned part-time creatives into full-time professional artists, and we have altered the brand of our city. The economic element of this is so important because in order to achieve equity, there has to be a sacrifice of privilege. Mm. We're working to achieve equity by way of reparations. And we achieve that by way of authorship and economic justice. So we've been doing that in a myriad of ways. Many of you visited the Black Lives Matter mural on Indiana Avenue in 2020. That was uh, the first thing we did, like Ashley talked about, kind of right before we were gang gang. Right at the start, large artistic moments that asked you to pay attention to something. That mural told the truth about what was happening in our country. It told the truth about the incredible artists that were around every day in Indianapolis. It told the truth about Indiana Avenue. And it told the truth when it was vandalized seven days in. Art can't help but to tell the truth and to bring people together. That is what art does. After the mural, we just didn't look back. We raised $250,000 in philanthropic seed money and we were only able to do that because of the relationships we'd built earlier in our career. Brian Payne, shout out um, Brian Payne, shout out Brian Payne was the first person to know about Gang Gang. And he was the first person to commit funding and infrastructure from CICF. And then the Herbert Simon Family Foundation said that there is no option but to invest in the work that could end racism. Shout out to Rachel Simon. Since then, we've programmed East 10th Street. We were creative directors when March Madness was in Indy last year. Uh, Babe curated 263 live performances over four weekends with his team. We've programmed Friday nights at the Taggart Memorial in partnership with the Parks Alliance for the last two years. We held a performance series at Butler University. We started a music fellowship with the Arts Council called Next Up, and we made butter. Butter is successful because it is the truth. After 2020, many places started to exhibit the work of black artists. Because of our experience at those shows, because of our experience with Drip at Newfields, butter was something that we had to do ourselves. We had to do the work justice, and we had to figure out equity in action. Butter is culture. Butter is the future. Butter is giving artists a platform to do what they do best create environments where we all feel like we can be ourselves. So for those of you not yet familiar, Butter is a multi-day fine art fair that happens at the Stutz in downtown Indianapolis. Now heading into our third year, uh, the art fair is a full experience that centers black visual artists by exhibiting and working to sell their art on their behalf. It is another gang gang experiment to test new models of equity in the arts, uh, so we don't require any uh, fees to participate, nor do we take any commission on sales. At Butter, 100% of the sales return to the artists, which is a, um, we're testing this theory as it relates to equity in, in, in the fine arts space. And it worked. In 2021, Butter happened over Labor Day weekend, and we wanted, we thought we would get probably around like 1,000 people to come to Butter. We ended up getting uh, around 4,000. It was supposed to be like hors d'oeuvres, or like we food hors d'oeuvres. They just food ran out and shit. It was like, damn. <laughs> People, nothing to eat after 10 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so um, almost 4,000 people came and we sold over $65,000 worth of art. Um, and that, you know, once again went directly to the artists. Months later, I mean, sales more than doubled uh, to 175000 And uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of, you know, good impact, you know, for the creative economy in Indianapolis within that sphere. Shout out Brady Ulis in the room. Yeah, Brady's over here. <laughs> yeah, Brady. Head, head curator. <laughs> Keeping us all legit in there. Uh, this year, so we, we planned, so we thought, okay, so we got, uh, you know, 4,000, um, you know, let's, let's kind of plan for a little bit more uh, for, for, for Butter 2. And, you know, we tripled the team and we saw 8,000 attendees, ran out of food again. <laughs> 
and t-shirts. That's why we got butter t-shirts. Try to make up for it. You can get your butter t-shirts. It's, it's like three months later. <laughs> Come get your butter tees. It's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what I said. Um, but I mean, so you know, we we are finding ways to support artists in, in creative ways and, and testing new theories and practices. And we sold over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars work uh, of art in in, in in butter two just this year. And it, you know, all that money is going to living contemporary black artists. Uh, a, a lot of acquisitions from museums and private collectors. And you know, shout out to our local artists here in Indianapolis because uh, that's you know the majority of the show. Uh, but butter is big. Yeah, yeah. Shout out. We got some butter artists in the crowd. What's up, Kim? Deanna in the building. Ashley. Um, and and the, but I think so. We do a lot of cool shit. And you know, thanks to Babe and, and, and her marketing squad. And we, we have a really kick-ass brand. But you know, what's really happening at Gang Gang uh, is reparational work. You know, this is about identity through the arts in the same way uh, that I talked about the American Renaissances. And you know, more. The more we find out about truth, um, and really just the truth about our identity, then the more we find out and figure out how super fucking cool it is to know the truth, uh, especially as it relates to American culture. Um, and you know, and we're studying this in a way that feels like critical race theory, uh, but it's actually critical culture theory. Critical culture theory, coined by our very own Elise Tucker Bounce. Uh, critical culture theory is a way to teach the history of America by way of our creative culture. For instance, who's the father of rock and roll? Guesses, anyone? Okay. My gosh, like, so this, this group is actually uh, more educated than I thought. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you, you can never really tell. You know what I mean? So I. Uh, <laughs> now what do you think? You're like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> damn. You know, I was like, that was a big part of that moment in, in the script. You know what I mean? But. Uh, <laughs> of course, everybody. Here yeah, I mean, yeah, that's it. what I thought. It's, it's like, I just like, if like Whatever. other audiences, they yeah. would have screamed <laughs> Elvis, right? You know what I mean? But uh, <laughs> the fathers of rock and roll were Little Richard. Uh, and, and Chuck Berry, and, and, and before rock and roll, there was the blues, and you had you know Ray Charles and Muddy Waters. Uh, there would be no rock and roll or country music or hip hop or much of anything without those sorrowful blues songs, the foundation of America's music from black artists. I want everyone to know the authors of rock and roll. I think it's important to know the authors of American creative culture. It's important to know the truth about history, but let's tell the story through culture and through the arts. Let's, let's tell the story in a way that brings us together. Our creative history is so beautiful. It's rich. It's authentic. And there's another side of that coin. Why um, we know America's history is, is also painful. We know America's history is, is awful, can be awful. And it's America's history. It's America's present, but it doesn't have to be America's future. Our country is still in a period of liberation. The Underground Railroad is still a thing. We're just laying down different tracks. And many of you aren't allies. You're actually abolitionists. And we need you now more than ever. In just a second, I think. Ryan, yeah. are we going to premiere a video? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Damn. All right. Just a second. We're going to premiere a video before Instagram. Okay. <laughs> we kicked off um, an individual donor campaign in August to raise $500,000 by the year end, and we're hoping that this video we made helps. Um, Gang Gang is a nonprofit organization who has put millions of dollars directly into the creative economy in Indianapolis, and we are far from stopping. We have raised 100,000 of our half million goal, and while we need your help, this work requires your support both financially and emotionally. We want you to sit with these thoughts. We want you to think and talk more about the fact that we're all living inside of someone's decision to create an entire society, an entire system that assigns a hierarchy to people based on their face. Just to be clear, 
we are all living within some guy's decision to assign hierarchy to humans based on our face color. The type of support we get is mostly to work, to collaborate, which is incredible and is our most exciting work. But we also need support to exist. We need individual donors like you to support us because of what we're thinking and testing every day. So no matter what sector you're in, we all have a role in the recognition that artists are the storytellers of our time and have a hugely important role in the future of cities. So our asks of you today are to donate, to collaborate, to pay the artists, and to tell the truth. <laughs>